are us, and we had better look out for them. But in recent years, I think, uh, the feeling of the anti-government, anti-politics feeling has reached levels of near contempt, uh, at least uh, high levels of anger and frustration and cynicism reflected in the uh, term limit initiatives on the ballots, uh, people who say they would not run for office, young people at this very institution who say they would like to work in public policy, they would like to make laws, they would like to make regulation, but they would not like to run for office. That's for somebody else who can stand uh, the criticism, who can stand uh, the um, levels of, of near contempt. Tonight, we are about not only describing what's happened in uh, our system, but talking about some ways uh, to restore trust and confidence uh, in politics and government, and particularly in the state of Massachusetts, which for somebody like me from the Northwest, it seems as if that anti-politics feeling was almost invented here, packaged and put together here so that uh, it could be exported uh, to the rest of the country. Uh, it's very hard here in Massachusetts, as it is in the rest of the country, but politics has a very hard edge here for someone who comes from the West Coast and is observing uh, what goes on in Massachusetts. So what can we do about that? Well, tonight we've assembled uh, three, four people who are going to be able to speak to that issue, and one of them, at least, is going to be able to give us a broad national perspective on what, in fact, has gone wrong uh, in our politics and why. Uh, E.J. Dion is a staff writer covering ideas and politics for the national news staff of the Washington Post. Before joining the Post in April of 1990, he worked for the New York Times, first covering state and local politics from 77 to 80, then the presidential campaign of 80. Following a period as a foreign correspondent, he was named chief national political correspondent and received his second nomination for the Pulitzer Prize for political coverage. Dion also helped to establish the New York Times CBS News poll. He's a 1973 graduate of Harvard. He attended Oxford University from 73 to 75 as a Rhodes Scholar. His book, Why Americans Hate Politics, was published in May of this year. But perhaps most importantly in terms of Mr. Dion's credentials, qualifications to be here tonight, uh, from 1973 to 75, while a student here, he served as a member of the Institute of Politics Student Advisory Committee, which certainly qualifies him on the subject of politics. Paul Salucci was elected Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in November of 1990. Prior to that, he served 14 years in the legislature, first for four terms in the House, then as senator representing the Middlesex Worcester District. In 1989, he was elected assistant Republican leader. In 1988, he chaired the Massachusetts campaign for George Bush. Barbara Anderson is executive director, Citizens for Limited Taxation. She started with the organization as a volunteer collecting signatures on a state tax amendment in 1977. She served as administrative assistant for CLT and in 1980 was named executive director. She writes a bi-weekly column in the Patriot Ledger and appears on a weekly talk show on Boston's WRKO radio. Barney Frank is serving his sixth term in the United States House of Representatives. Prior to entering Congress, he was a member of the Massachusetts House. He's held staff positions in the Congress and was executive assistant to Boston Mayor Kevin White. We'll begin with E.J. Dion to set the stage for us, 15 minutes or so. Then we'll follow with each of the panelists for five, give E.J. another shot, and then we'll go to your questions and comments from the floor. E.J. Dion. I want to thank uh, Mr. Royer for that very generous introduction, although the, uh, f my feeling was about politics was expressed <clears throat> once by Tom Oliphant, who said that I ignored all these things that were said at Harvard and Oxford, and my ba basic sort of feelings and beliefs and everything I know about politics was learned in a childhood spent in Fall River, Massachusetts. And as Congressman Frank can tell you, they know more about politics in Fall River than in Washington, Harvard, Oxford, or any of these other places. I'm honored to be here at the Kennedy School, a place I spent a lot of time at when I was a student. Uh, and I was a regular at a seminar uh, given by a wonderful political columnist called Bob Healy, uh, who I suppose tonight should be referred to as a columnist for the other paper. Um, I have actually a secret to disclose to all my friends on the other paper, 
Uh, and in fact, since the book came out, there's, I have no greater debts than to Marty Nolan and Tom Oliphant and Ellen Goodman at the Globe, uh, but my secret is that I grew up in a Herald family. Uh, in fact, I grew up as a, in a Republican family in Fall River, Massachusetts. That's a little bit like being an anarchist at the John F. Kennedy School of Government or being an optimist at uh, Fenway Park in September. Um, <laughs> And so that experience has given me a lifelong love for contrarians, dissidents, and outcasts of all sorts. Uh, my late dad was a very open-minded man, uh, but I know that if uh, he knew I had to speak at a school named for John F. Kennedy, he'd be glad to know that the forum was sponsored by the Boston Herald. Um, <laughs> And I'm a little daunted to be speaking uh, with this distinguished panel. I know Barbara Anderson is going to find a hidden tax increase in whatever I say and will brilliantly attack it. Uh, and I know that Lieutenant Governor Salucci is a brilliant advocate for Governor Weld's kind of libertarian economic ideas. In fact, we hear down in Washington that he believes so much in Governor Weld's ideas that he lobbied very hard uh, for his appointment to replace John Sununu. Unfortunately, uh, he didn't succeed. And, and finally, there's Barney Frank, who is not only the, uh, one of the smartest and most candid people in Washington, and since I still think of myself as from Fall River, my congressman, but he's also one of the funniest. He's a kind of member of the Reporters Hall of Fame, the sort of person uh, you can call uh, and ha he'll give you a brilliant and hilarious paragraph which you can use either at the beginning or at the end uh, of whatever you write and everyone attributes his great line to you. Um, in fact, he is so well loved in journalists that uh, painstaking investigative reporting uh, has revealed that even Howie Carr thinks Barney Frank has a lot of virtues. Um, <laughs> But if I tell more jokes, Barney's going to bury me, so I will try to move along to what I came here to say. Uh, if there's a fundamental theme to my book, uh, it is that pol Americans have come to hate politics, especially at the national level, uh, because politics has been dominated by symbolic debates about symbolic issues uh, that signify almost nothing the day after Election Day. Uh, there is an almost complete disconnect, I think, between what happens in political campaigns uh, and what happens in government. Uh, and increasingly, there's a disconnect between what happens in government and what's supposed to happen in government. Uh, one of the most revealing events recently uh, was this federal crime bill, which ended up not getting enacted into law. And the idea of the sponsor that's of this federal crime bill uh, was to prove how tough they were on crime by making it a capital crime to kill federal egg inspectors. Uh, now, I'm sure all of us care a lot about the lives of federal egg inspectors, but I don't think that's what most voters are concerned about when they start talking about street crime. And think back to the 1988 campaign. I mean, how much talk was there in 1988 about the savings and loan crisis, about the changes in, the, in Eastern Europe, about the crisis and the looming crisis in the Middle East? Um, there was no, very little talk about this. How much talk in 1988 was there about the problems that Americans face in their day-to-day -day lives? How to balance work and family? Uh, how to send kids to college? How to help, help kids who don't go to college find decent jobs? Uh, and there were broader questions. How, how do we as a society uh, vindicate rights yet get individuals to meet their responsibilities? How do we promote social policies that are simultaneously compassionate uh, and encourage self-reliance? How do we create dynamic workplaces where employers and employees feel and act on mutual responsibilities to each other and therefore help us compete in what is becoming a much, much <coughs> tougher world? There was very little about this uh, in 1988. And I think that's one of the reasons why Americans, especially in the last couple of years, uh, have come to react against politics. I think the most basic reason for our hatred of politics uh, is the rise in the 1960s of a kind of cultural politics on both the left and the right, uh, which left uh, vast numbers of Americans wondering what politics was about now. Uh, from the progressive era through the New Deal and the Fair Deal and the Eisenhower administration and the New Frontier and the Great Society and even in the early years of the Nixon administration, uh, Americans had come to politics to solve problems and resolve disputes. Uh, they had come to see government and politics as being on balance a good thing 
uh, that tempered the market and made it work better, uh, that sent millions of people to college on the GI Bill, helped people buy homes, built a vast highway system, set up Medicare, strengthened Social Security. A government even benefited Republicans, though they were often reluctant to admit it. Uh, when Senator Hollings of South Carolina ran for president, uh, he spoke of running into a man who said that he had gone to college on the GI Bill, bought a home with an FHA loan, started a business with a small business administration loan, sent his kids to college with national defense education loans. His mom was retired on Social Security and Medicare and was very happy. And this man was voting Republican to get the government off his back. Um, I think that what cultural politics from the 1960s did uh, was to move the focus of the political debate away from problem solving and to toward the most fundamental kinds of moral questions, which individuals have a hard enough time settling for themselves, let alone for everybody else through politics. Questions like, when does life begin? How should men and women relate to each other? How should children be raised? What values, if any, should the government promote? Now, at some point, of course, every one of these questions are fundamentally political and broadly constructed politics has always dealt with these issues. But I think our cultural battles, necessary though they were, had a high cost, especially when they entered the political arena. Uh, in the first place, I think they focused politics on a series of issues uh, that were often of more concern to upper middle class voters, left or right, uh, than they were to most average working Americans, black or white, male or female. These folks were mainly interested in how government and politics might help them improve their own standard of living uh, and how the government could help improve the life chances of their kids. Uh, secondly, it's my view that cultural politics has continued to be dominant long after most Americans have settled the basic questions involved for themselves. I think what's truly disturbing about our discussion of culture and culture and politics is how narrowly, rigidly, and ideologically we define culture and how misleading at times both the left and the right can be. And so here I'd like to broaden the discussion a little bit uh, and talk about how I think the left and the right have made a certain fundamental, if certain fundamental errors. Um, they've made the mistake of forgetting on the left that government isn't everything and on the right uh, that economics isn't everything. Uh, that market economics and democratic politics both rest on something called society uh, and its rich web of institutions that owe their existence to neither government uh, nor to the market. I think the problem has two faces. On the right, there's a problem um, which I like to refer to as market imperialism. Um, I think that the right often sees the market as a cure to whatever ails us. Uh, although the right often uses words like family, work, and neighborhood uh, in President Reagan's famous trilogy, uh, it rarely defends the autonomy of the family, the rights of workers, or the stability of neighborhoods when those values <coughs> come into conflict with the market. Uh, much of the Western right now operates under the slogan, all power to the invisible hand, and it doesn't worry at all whom the invisible hand might slap in the face at any given time. The left has a different problem, I think. Because it is suspicious of the market, it has looked at the state to temper the market, uh, to regulate it and to improve it. Now, I think all this is perfectly fine as far as it goes. Um, and I think that most people uh, believe that there is a role uh, for government. But when I was coming in tonight, I saw this wonderful billboard, which I assume was actually put up by a conservative to bash liberals, but I think the thought was a very good thought. It was a quote, uh, you may have seen it near Logan Airport from Hubert Humphrey, where Humphrey said, the impersonal hand of government can never replace the helping hand of a neighbor. And I think there's a fundamental truth here that liberals have at times seemed to ignore. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure they ever didn't believe this. Who was more liberal than Hubert Humphrey? But I think when they talk about politics, they do seem to ignore it. Um, in particular, we know certain things. We know that most people rightly feel that the state has limits, just as the market does. In particular, we're no more comfortable with the idea of the state bringing up our kids uh, than we are with the market bringing up our kids. If the problem with the market is that its animating principle uh, is often short-term economic gain, 
The problem with the modern, modern state is, it, is that it is often organized in, an, in almost as self-interested a way uh, as the market, responded, responding to a series of well-organized groups who define and claim an expanding set of rights and benefits. Now, let me be clear. I'm not, I'm not against the market, and I'm for the compassionate state. Uh, but what we've lost sight of, as the sociologist Alan Wolf has argued in a brilliant book called Who's Keeper, which I recommend to everyone, uh, is that the market and state are not our only options, and that neither is very good at promoting the virtues that are essential to holding a society together. The virtues like generosity, responsibility, a willingness to act in ways that take into account the public good uh, as well as our own private interests. Uh, there is only so much that the state and the market can do to promote those values, uh, and sometimes the state and the market both can get in their way. Wolf argues that between the state and the market lies something that mediates and tempers both of them, that promotes the very values that democracy and the market need to survive and prosper. Following Eastern Europeans like Vaclav Havel, I think we need to remember that there is something called civil society. What Havel is talking about is all of those institutions, the family, the voluntary association, the trade union, the professional association, the church and the synagogue, the mosque, the networks of friends and neighbors that every one of us at some point relies on. Uh, Wolf's point in his book uh, is that under the influence of mar the market, we tend not to take seriously our group obligations. Uh, we enter into them or leave them as our self-interest uh, demands. Um, this isn't wholly satisfactory if your goal uh, is a smoothly running society. But government on its, its own is not enough and indeed can also encroach on the very small scale institutions that hold a society together. I think that what we need to do if we're going to take the next step toward a new kind of politics is to remember that the goal in some fundamental way of both the market and the state uh, is to serve society. I think that in the end we have to look back on the last 10 or 12 years of politics as presenting us with a series of false choices, that our politics has constantly forced us to choose between things we don't like, or more often, and in some ways more destructively, between things we like. We have been forced to choose between self-reliance and compassion when most of us are for both. We've been forced to choose between being for feminism and being for the family, when most of us are in fact for both. Most Americans believe that men and women are equal, that men and women are in the workforce to stay, and that this is all a good thing. Most, Ameri men, most Americans believe in tolerance for all kinds of alternative lifestyles. They also believe that there is a special place to be given for mom and pop and kids, and the whole task of the fam of the f that the family has as the only social institution we do have uh, that is given to the care and treatment of children. Um, our politics in the last few years has given us another false choice on the race issue that we have seen in our politics campaign after campaign in which people's legitimate feelings about the idea that work should be rewarded uh, is turned into an attack on poor people who find themselves on welfare. We have had campaign after campaign in which the legitimate resentments of working class people, white people, who have devoted their whole lives to the care of their families is somehow put down either from liberals who somehow don't appreciate what they've done or who is certainly seen that way uh, by the folks who have made those sacrifices or by conservatives who try to exploit the, the legitimate feelings these folks have and turn them into uh, into racial politics. I think we've had no worse example of how far a politics of false choices can go uh, than in the campaign of David Duke down in Louisiana, whom I think gave voice to legitimate feelings in the name of views and attitudes that are rejected by the vast majority of Americans. And if anybody tells you that David Duke speaks for most people, look at every national poll, which has shown that about 75 or 80 percent of Americans reject that approach to politics. Uh, but I think that our politics has allowed this sort of thing to happen and that that is one of the reasons why Americans are turned off and pulling away. Uh, when you do talk shows, as I've done a lot on for this book, uh, your publisher always tells you uh, that you have to figure out a way to mention the book in the talk show. Now, that can be very obnoxious because you end up saying, like, as I said in my book, Why Americans Hate Politics, and it sounds very artificial. And then one day on one of these shows, uh, I discovered a way to do this by accident. I said to, I was arguing with the talk show host, and I said, you know, 
Why Americans Hate Politics is an optimistic book. Now, that sounds strange, but, and if I really wanted to, I could repeat the name of the book a second time. And the truth of the matter is that Why Americans Hate Politics really is an optimistic book. Uh, because I think that the kind of frustrations, uh, and I did it, um, <laughs> I think that the, the frustrations people feel while they are being given vent through campaigns like David Duke's are also having a positive impact on people in public life, and I think that Barney and, and the lieutenant governor can speak to this. I think there's a kind of openness across ideological lines right now uh, that did not exist before <coughs> the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, you can't tell who's left and who's right anymore in foreign policy. Pat Buchanan in his announcement speech sounded uh, like a new leftist when he said he was fighting for the destruction of the Cold War state. I hadn't heard that kind of phrase since I was here at Harvard back in the 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, you have people like Barney Frank and Jack Kemp uh, who find that they can, while they disagree on certain things as they always did, uh, can actually agree across lines on things that need to happen, that liberals are increasingly open to arguments that say, yes, social policy should encourage a sense of personal responsibility and self-reliance. And at least some conservatives like Jack Kemp are open to arguments that say, unless we find a way to use government again to solve social problems, uh, we are going to be in big trouble as a society. Across the old Berlin walls of ideology, we're looking for ways to balance rights and responsibilities, compassion and self-reliance, a commitment to values, and a respect for the choices made by others. Uh, out of this search for a new balance, a balance, if you will, between 60s values and 80s values, uh, I think there is a new politics to be born in our country. And I certainly hope it is, because if there's one thing I'm sure of, it's that if we spend the next decade arguing over which was worse, the selfish 80s or the permissive 60s, we're going to waste the entire 1990s, and that would be a tragedy for us as a country. Thank you very much. Governor Salucci. Thank you very much. I'm most pleased to be here this evening. I would like to thank the Kennedy School and the Boston Herald for sponsoring this forum uh, and listen with interest uh, to our guest lecturer this evening and did have the opportunity to read parts of your book, not the, uh, not the entire book yet. Uh, but it is uh, a rather interesting analysis of where we've, where we've been and maybe where we're heading. And I think we can look back here to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and kind of see a little bit of uh, what has been happening on the national level. I'm, I'm one who believes that the election campaign that Bill Weld and I came through, the 1990 election cycle, was really uh, characterized by significant anger among the citizens of the Commonwealth. And although some would argue that that anger can lead to disengagement, I suspect that the reason there were record turnouts in the primary in September of 1990 uh, is that anger and the fact that we had some competitive races, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side, kind of galvanize the people of this state to participate. And I am one who believes that it's this competition uh, that is really the hope for our state and I think in the long run the hope for our democracy. And that doesn't mean that we will not have some ups and downs along that road, uh, but I am one who sincerely believes that competitive races are, are good for this democracy. I'm one who sincerely believes that uh, the return of a competitive two-party government uh, to Massachusetts has been good for the government and I think in the long run will be good for the citizens of our state. So there was a lot of anger back in 1990. And I think the voters, uh, particularly on primary day, vented that anger. It was very interesting because the candidates who were considered the establishment candidates, Steve Pierce on the Republican side and Frank Bellotti on the Democratic side, did not fare too well. Uh, it was the outsiders, John Silver, Bill Weld, uh, who were able to win the support 
of those very angry voters. So that election, particularly the primary, I believe was a massive vote for change in how the government of Massachusetts was operating. And it was a record turnout, and an awful lot of people uh, participated, particularly on the Republican side. We had the largest uh, vote in a Republican primary since 1960. And that was good for the party because it gave us a little bit of a base so that we could go in for those final few weeks of the campaign with some momentum. And that was also a pretty good race at the top between Bill Weld and John Silver. And I think that once that election was over, I think it's interesting to note what has happened uh, over the past uh, 12 months. Massachusetts was kind of heading over the cliff. We were heading for disaster. There was no doubt in my mind that if we had not made some significant progress on the fiscal situation that we faced last January, that come June of this year, if we had gone down to Wall Street and said, geez, our plans didn't work, uh, we need to borrow $700 million to balance the books back here in Massachusetts, I suspect that the bond raters would have dropped the bond rating of the state to junk bond status. Now, that would have been a catastrophe for the economy, for the government, for this state. It's a catastrophe that I think would have taken Massachusetts a decade to recover from. But an interesting thing happened in our state. After a few skirmishes between a new rookie Republican administration and the more seasoned Democratic leadership in the legislature, there was a decision at the top, the legislative leadership and in our administration, to kind of put partisan politics aside, that we were heading over the cliff. We were heading for a catastrophe. And we needed to work together if we were going to restore some fiscal stability and political stability to the government of Massachusetts. And we did that. We started having these weekly summit meetings on Monday afternoons with the President and the Speaker and the Chairpersons of House and Senate Ways and Means and the Republican leaders, the Governor and myself, and Peter Nesson, the Secretary of administration and finance. And although at times those meetings uh, were difficult, the first few, there were a lot of uh, pregnant pauses, I guess you could say, uh, they became remarkably productive. We were able to set an agenda. We were able to agree on revenues. We were able to bring some stability uh, to a state had, that had been reeling out of control. And it's, there's still competition. There's a competitive two-party government in Massachusetts now, and Governor Weld's ability to sustain vetoes in the Senate and his pledge not to raise taxes was what shaped this entire budget debate. But it did get everyone working together, and I am convinced that because we did work together, we were able to avoid catastrophe in our state. And I'm not saying, uh, and, and I think it's interesting to note, that there was a poll done recently by John Silva, and it showed that the favorable rating for Governor Well, those who consider the fact that he's doing an excellent, a good, or fair job, is about 70 percent. Now, that's a remarkable statistics in the very tough economic times that we've faced in our state. And it's uh, remarkable in light of uh, many of the measures that we have had to take in terms of budget cuts uh, to get this fiscal stability to Massachusetts. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that I'm not convinced yet that the voters of Massachusetts and the voters of America and the citizens uh, have given up on politics. Uh, but I do believe uh, that competition from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and good debate through these competitive races uh, can restore confidence among the voters. I think it's very important that those of us who run for office and get into office, that we do everything we can, can to implement our campaign programs. It's not always possible. 
when you have a Republican administration and a Democratic legislature, you can't do everything that you want to do. Sometimes you have to compromise to get programs through, to keep the government running, to restore things with some sense of balance. So, and, and I think the other thing we have to do, and I think this also cuts across uh, partisan lines, I think we need to treat everyone, everyone we deal with, with respect and with decency. And I think we have to try to instill that sense of respect throughout the government. And that's not always easy. I think that we've got to make sure that the people who run the government, the cabinet secretaries, the agency heads, the people who work in the agencies, that they treat everyone they come into contact in their agencies as the customer, as the person that they work for. And I am convinced that if we can do that, uh, that we can make improvements, that we can restore confidence in government among the citizenry. Thank you. Barbara Anderson. I read the book. That's going to put me at a disadvantage. Um, well, you wait till I'm through before you say whether I'm blessed or not, E.J. That's all right. Because um, I'm, I'm going to try it here to, to address the subject matter, which is how to restore the public's trust in politics, by rebutting the basic assumption. Why would anybody want to restore the public's trust in politics? Politics is the art of destroying faith in government. You're not supposed to have trust in politics. You know, it's really hard for me to imagine that back in Mesopotamia about 6,000 years ago, on Monday, people invented government and then on Tuesday night decided to hate it. And it just didn't work that way. Somewhere there was an interim. And in that interim, politics replaced government. And then we decided to hate it because they worked at giving us reasons to. Keep in mind that both government and politics started in the Middle East. So we've had government and politics in the Middle East longer than anywhere else, and look where they are. So this is not a good sign for the future of our hemisphere. Now, EJ's book is great. It really is, and I wish you'd all read it because it would be easier for me to rebut it if you had all read it. And what he said is true, and, and I started out reading, and I can show you here, EJ. I started out reading, and I was underlining everything because I agreed with so much. And then I realized it was silly to underline everything because at the end you end up with you know, no way to determine what you particularly liked or didn't like. So I stopped underlining. But by the time I got to the end, I realized that though it's a great book and it really the, the concept that you just gave us was, was terrific, it missed the point entirely. <laughs> because he focuses on symbolic issues and how some of us fiscal conservatives and, and people, I mean, my, my philosophy is very much like Paul and, and, and Bill Wells. And I think everything Paul said tonight is absolutely accurate. And they're doing their best to restore faith in government. And what he says needs to be done needs to be done. And I, I certainly share their political philosophy. And I understand what you're saying about the left and the right, because I've always been uncomfortable with both the left and the right, too. But you're missing certain basic items. Because what people are angry about is not the ideological differences. What people are angry about are little items that inspire public hate, hate such, as, such as the following item. Recent, I'll stick with the Herald here to start with. Recent Herald headlines. Some are ideological. Weld asked DYS to block release of admitted killer. And you ask yourself, why does Weld have to ask DYS to block the release of an admitted killer? Or study. Congress favors spending over cuts, 43 to 1. And that fits in with the ideolo ideological point you're making. But these are the ones that people focus on. Flynn employees get bargain rents on city apartments. Relationship pays off for friend of T retirement on board. PAC money buys what voters can't. Guards at Deer Island cash in on workers' comp. You all saw that article in the Herald, the particular sentence. At the Deer Island House of Correction, one guard is collecting $422 a week in workers' compensation because he claims he is traumatized by working with people in blue uniforms. <laughs> And to be fair, I'll mention some other newspaper headlines. Food stamp fraud. Mistakes cost $1 billion. Foley says House will no longer fix members' parking tickets. Broker milks public pensions for private profit. Broker bank use pensions for gain. And speaking of banks, there's a little matter of the SNL scandal, which EJ does mention. Can we talk about the SNL scandal and restoring trust in politics in the same form? How? Item, the federal government going back to um, the SNLs. And then here's a story that was in the Herald last week on Graham Rudman, 
the thing that they told us was going to fix everything, which was, I suppose, in, in, in originally ideological. In 1985, Congress passed Graham Rudman Hollings, which was designed to eliminate annual budget deficits by 1991. This act was amended in 1987 to extend the deadline for a balanced budget into 1993. In 1990, though, the act was essentially scuttled. The government was so far away from meeting the fixed budget targets called for in Grad Rudman Hollings that Congress eliminated the fixed targets and instead ruled that the targets could be, quote, adjusted for a good reason. How far afield is the current deficit from the original Graham Hollings? The original law would have had the budget balanced by now. While the 1987 revision said the annual deficit could not exceed $50 billion in 1992, the Congressional Budget Office estimates that the actual fiscal 1992 deficit will be a new high of $362 billion, which is more relevant than a discussion between conservatives and liberals. The other thing that, that people really love is when the hypocrisy of, of people in government. They pass laws for themselves and then exempt themselves, or pass laws for us and exempt themselves from the laws. Here are the laws that Congress has exempted themselves from. The Americans with Disabilities Act, Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the Equal Employment Opportunity Act, the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the Fair Labor Standards Act, the Freedom of Information Act, and we all know by now that they've also exempted themselves from laws against sexual harassment. So it's this sort of thing that causes us to look askew at government. Here's the state government, and I'm, I'm going to skip over our state government because now Paul and, and Bill have that under control. But let's. <laughs> Let's run down to Connecticut to take a look. Why are taxpayers in Connecticut angry? Because they perceive there's an ideological difference there between the people running the government? No. Two weeks before the election, with his lead slipping fast, Weicker ran an ad on, and, and did an ad on Connecticut television stations in response to his opponent's charge that he was in favor of an income tax. And Weicker's ad said, and I quote, I'm Lowell Weicker with a message for John Rowland, he said in his most gladiatorial voice. This is out of the... Uh, on the New Yorker. Stop distorting facts and scaring people with misquotes and half-truths. Long before your negative ads, I was opposed to a state income tax. The people of Connecticut and I know it would be like pouring gasoline on the fires of recession, and nobody's for that. Then, of course, Weicker presided over an income tax increase, and when he was charged with this, he said, quote, I never made any damn pledge, but even if I had, I would have broken it. <laughs> Now, you want to know why the people in, in Connecticut are angry? Local government. Um, city of Chelsea, here in, Ma in Massachusetts, gone into receivership because of corruption that has been going on in that city for years. And the solution that will be coming soon from the receiver, raise property taxes on the same people in Chelsea. The, the town of Weymouth just had an, a vote on their local election not to raise sewer fees. Town meeting met again a couple weeks later and raised sewer fees in defiance of what the voters wanted. This is the sort of thing that voters can, can, can focus on. We can't restore public trust in, in, in politics. It would be very, very dangerous to have trust in something that is operating with stolen money. As long as they can take our money without our consent, there's no reason for them to act in ways that inspire trust. Look at people who like to change things, like Bill and Paul. The game on Beacon Hill right now, despite Paul talking about all the, the cooperation, have you been watching it the last couple days? The big game today. Uh, yesterday was, let's pass a pay raise for state employees so we Democrats can tell the state employees that we voted to raise their pay, knowing the governor is going to veto it so we don't have to come up with the money. Now, do you really think state employees are going to buy this? And do you think that's going to make them like government anymore to know that this silly game is being played? The game on Beacon Hill right now is not to govern, but to make sure that the opposition party can't. And that is still a fact of life. But sometimes things do get done. They told me just 15 minutes ago that I have to have a solution, too. So I come up with a solution. Sometimes things get done, and that's when the voters get involved and learn to play the political game themselves. Now, I've hated politics all my life because I felt helpless. But once I joined Citizens for Limited Taxation and found out about the initiative petition process, I no longer felt helpless, at least about city and state government. Now I have some control. Prop 2 and a half gives me some control at the local level. The initiative petition process at least get, gives me a chance to be a player, and my members a chance to be players on Beacon Hill. So we feel we're part of the process, that they might still take our money, or they're going to sweat blood to do it. And in the process of our knowing that, the hatred dissolves, and we too can find some of this amusing. At the, at the, at the national level, we don't have the initiative petition process. So we're frustrated. Now we've come up with another idea, which is term limitation. 
And as long as we can make them uncomfortable, and we are making them uncomfortable, it's, that's more worth it than passing it. You know, the next three years, while they worry about it, they might actually start to shape up because of their fear of it. And as long as we, the voters, become part of this process and have their attention once in a while because of something we can do to them while we play the political game, then possibly we do have some control and things will change. But forget about restoring trust in politics. Politics has abused our trust for 6,000 years. Citizens should concentrate instead on learning to play the political game. Thank you. I want to thank EJ for the kind words, but uh, having been congratulated for candor, I suppose I should indulge in some and <laughs> say that the credit isn't entirely due me because uh, I must in candor say that not all of my candor was voluntary, so I don't know if I get entire <laughs> credit for it. Some of it was, some of it wasn't. The, I do have a difference with EJ's approach and Barbara Anderson's approach at, at one level. And I find one difference that I have with both of them is the theoretical construct or the mode of analysis in which politics is something that happens to the voters. The voters are, in fact, the author of much of their own discontent. EJ said they have false choices. Well, they nominate the candidates in the primaries. People who were unhappy with the choice in 1988 of George Bush and Michael Dukakis ought to understand that no Martian had any hand in the selection of those two as candidates. We had primaries and caucuses, and the people had a chance to participate. And if people choose not to participate, that's a valid choice. That doesn't make it right or wrong. But a, a theme, and, and the same I would, I would disagree with Bobby, she said, well, voters have, can now get involved. They could always get involved. They get involved, in my experience, when they are unhappy. When people are happy, they tend to be less involved in politics. When they get really angry, they get more involved. Talking about term limits is the answer seems to me to be a very backward way to do it. And term limits don't bother me uh, personally, so I, I, I'm not losing any sleep over it. But in fact, what I think term limits will do is, if you get them, give a lot of politicians a lot more job security. Because nobody's going to bother to run against you until the term is up. The term limit will then become the term. And people will say, well, why take him on now? He's going to be gone in a couple of years. Why get him angry? Uh, in fact, if people don't like the politicians in office, waiting for term limits is really a very inadequate way to go. The thing to do is to beat people. And people tell us, oh, you can't beat an incumbent. I wish. <laughs> the fact is that when people get angry enough, they can beat incumbents. In the Massachusetts State Senate last year, as Paul Salucci knows, incumbents got beat. Incumbents who never had any idea that they were going to get beat got beat. They got beat by people who didn't know they were going to beat them. <laughs> and, they, and they beat them. In New Jersey last year, in New Jersey last year, they defeated vast numbers. I mean, last month they defeated vast numbers of people. What happens is when people, now obviously incumbency is sometimes an advantage in various ways, and I think at the congressional level, we should go further. I outlaw the newsletters altogether. I don't send them. But in general, people underestimate what the voters can do. And EJ talks about the voters being angry at some kind of tactics. Well, I must tell you, there are very few politicians who run for office with a pre-existing commitment to a particular tactic. People do not say, as a matter of religious preference, I'm going to engage in tactic X. People tend to engage in the kind of tactics that get rewarded. And having the public Blame the politicians for campaigning is like blaming the TV programmers for TV programs. In fact, in both cases, it tends to be consumer-driven. Second point, not related, just in a list, and uh, it has to do with one reason why voters are angry at one particular segment, uh, that is Democratic presidential candidates. And I, I have not read EJ's book, I will say. I, I have read EJ's book the way people in my line of work read everybody's book, from the back, we look in the index for our name, and then we read that part. <laughs> bookstores in Washington, bookstores in Washington near the Capitol have the books face down for ease of, <laughs> for ease of thumbing. But if you really want to drive politicians crazy, Bob, don't talk about term limits, write a nasty book and don't have an index. <laughs> <laughs> but what, but the main reason I didn't read EJ's book yet is that I just wrote one. And uh, I didn't want to read it because I thought I might be too heavily influenced, and now I'm going to read it. But 
my book was in part about why the Democrats haven't done better in the presidential elections. And I do think that there was a very specific situation that we have here. I believe since 1968 and all the trauma of that year, we as Democrats have spent much too much time trying to make sure that our left was emotionally happy. Not enough time trying to take issues and put them in terms that would appeal to people in the center. And to that extent, I think there's considerable overlap in that part of the analysis uh, that E.J. E. Dionne does. I do think that Democrats have, in fact, overindulged our own left, not so much substantively as rhetorically, and have therefore disabled ourselves from presenting a better alternative. And that is one reason why one alternative that should have been available to people, a sensible liberalism, that, that I think is partly the political explanation for some of what E.J. talks about, where I agree, where people have undervalued the market and have tended, I mean, have undervalued what seems to me to be both politically and substantively a very good thing to do, namely take people who had other people and lock them up. Yes, there are people who ought to be locked up. We Democrats have been much too apologetic about talking about that because of, a, I think, fear of 68 and 72 coming back again. Third point, and I think this is the major issue at the national level, why we have the frustration. And I think the other problem I have with some of these analyses is that they are not historical enough. Although, Barbara, I must say, going back to Mesopotamia was probably too historical. <laughs> but many of the things that are listed as causing anger are, in fact, of fairly significant duration. There are people, as I look out, sitting in this audience who could tell you stories about Massachusetts politics that would be far more angering to the voters than the things Barbara just read about. I mean, there was a time when, for Massachusetts politicians, term limits were a good thing because it meant you would get out on good behavior. <laughs> so we are, and the same is true at the national level. I agree with many of the criticisms. I also believe that our politics is today far less corrupt, far more honest, conducted with a great deal more efficiency and vigor than at many points in the past. Why, given that, is there, as there no doubt is, so much more anger today? I'm not entirely sure, but I will take a, 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 a shot at one thing. I think at the federal level we have overpromised, as Bobby Anderson said with Graham Rudman, in none of which variants I ever supported, I must say. I never voted for it. So I, I, I complete not guilty on all that. But what we've got, I think, is a situation where we have overpromised. The problem is that some people are reluctant to stop overpromising even when we can. And I think 1992, and I'm very optimistic about this, is a very important year for us. For 20 years, America has tried to out Bo Jackson, Bo Jackson. He played baseball against baseball team, football against football team. We've been playing baseball and football against two teams, same day, at the same time. And it doesn't work well with only 10 players to take a compromise. We have been engaged in an arms race against the Soviet Union, and which they were able to keep up because they had no civilian economy, using their very efficient repressive mechanisms not to have to have one. So they were able to keep roughly even with us militarily. At the same time, we have been engaged in a civilian competition with almost every developed society except the Soviet Union, because they didn't have to have a military. We are the only society in the history of the world that could ever have contemplated doing both simultaneously. So I don't think we ought to be as self-flagellating as a society as we should have been. We now have the chance, thanks to our victory in the Cold War, which again, historically, we have not allowed ourselves as Democrats to be enthusiastic about because of our left. Uh, one of the things we were inhibited from doing was talking about the obvious moral superiority of our system to the communist system. Uh, and we've got to break that. And I think liberals ought to participate in celebrating our victory in the Cold War. But what that does is free up about $150 billion a year in military and intelligence spending that we no longer need. And what that means is I think we can break out of some of what's causing anger. Because I must say I tend to agree with Barbara that much of the anger is substantive in its, in its uh, uh, motivation. People feel they are paying too much and getting too little in return. You may argue about whether their, realis their, their expectations are entirely realistic. Uh, sometimes we do get the feeling that people want things but aren't fully aware of the consequences. And I'm always reminded of a uh, truth imparted to me in 1969 when I was working in City Hall by a uh, great statesman philosopher named Freddie Langone who said <laughs> when I was complaining about what I thought was an inconsistency on the part of people who wanted swimming pools built in an area, but complained about the construction trucks that seemed to me an inevitable part of building the swimming pool. And he leaned over and patted me on the knee and said to me, hey, kid, ain't you heard the news? 
Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Um, and I think that political truth, that political truth is part of the problem. We have a chance now, however, to break out of some of that dilemma. We have a chance that's rare. We have built a level of government that tried to do both, that tried to provide a decent standard of living, compete with the Russians in the arms race, compete with the Japanese. Ironically, I think historically the big criticism of Ronald Reagan is going to be that he was too much like Lyndon Johnson, who tried to fight the Vietnam War without in any way cutting back on the great society. And while Reagan tried to cut back on domestics, when he couldn't, he then went forward, and we went forward with him, in a kind of a joint effort. And we wound up trying to do too much. I think we overstrained the American system by this all-out arms race and all-out civilian effort. We now have the ability to shift, oh, three or four percent of our GNP, I believe, from the military area which we've won to the civilian area where we haven't done as well without sacrificing one iota of our security. I think if we set about doing that well, we will have done a lot to alleviate the anger in the way that is most sensible, and that's by really producing results. I just want to very quickly respond. I want to commend Lieutenant Governor Salucci for the single greatest bit of understatement I have ever heard from a public official when he said, quotes, that there was significant anger among citizens of the Commonwealth in 1990. I think he avoided saying rage, fury, and all kinds of words you couldn't put on television. Well, he wasn't talking um, about I wanted to, uh, to Barbara Anderson, I, it, she proved I was right. She did see a hidden tax increase in the book, and she did brilliantly attack it. Um, I think that, that there are two things. There's one point I agree with Barney Frank on, is the idea that this class of politicians is no worse than some previous class and may in some ways be better. I suppose Barbara also believes that going back to Mesopotamia, but I just remember the story where Daniel Webster, a distinguished Massachusetts politician, uh, wrote to a lobbyist saying, how can I carry this bill for you when you have not refreshed my retainer recently? So we oughtn't to feel so badly about some of uh, politicians who will go unnamed. Uh, in passing, I'd like to say um, that she quoted Lowell Weicker as saying, long before your negative ads, I was against the income tax. He said nothing about how he felt at the time the negative ad was run. Um, I, think that the, I think that the basic problem that the Democratic Party has faced is that in the old days, in the days of the New Deal and the Fair Deal, Democrats taxed Republicans to pay for programs for Democrats, and that's why there was a Democratic majority. And that what started happening in the 1960s and 1970s is that Democrats had to start taxing other Democrats to pay for programs for some Democrats. And I really do feel that created a fundamental rift uh, in the Democratic Party, which it's uh, had trouble dealing with ever since. Um, Barney talked about politics is something that happens to voters and that there is a sort of popular analysis about which seems to absolve voters of all responsibility. To some degree, I suspect that is a legitimate criticism of most of what journalists do. Uh, and yet I think that, that in fact the way political campaigns are run do create substantive problems that it's not simply the negative ads, although I've, I've been saying that if uh, the manufacturers of food products said about each other what, the political, what politicians say about each other in their commercials, we'd all lose a lot of weight because we'd stop eating anything except homegrown produce. But I think it goes beyond the problem of the negative ad. I really do think that we have repeatedly in our politics since the 1960s concentrated on issues that would divide the electorate without really resolving issues in a fundamental Way. I think this has happened most particularly on race. I think it's happened on sort of these whole size of government questions. Um, and I think the Republicans are now paying a price uh, for a certain kind of politics. Um, and, and maybe I could, I could close on this, which is to say that I think we are suffering in part because there's been a fundamental contradiction within the Republican electoral coalition uh, that you've had on the one side uh, up, upscale Republicans who were, as Bob Teeter, the president's poll taker, put it, pro-choice on everything. They wanted, and, and that might describe both Governor Weld and Lieutenant Governor Salucci, that they wanted small government 
they wanted low taxes and they wanted adults to do pretty much what they wanted whether in the bedroom or the marketplace and those folks tended to be upscale but Ronald Reagan also won a lot of votes and George Bush kept a lot of those votes from people who weren't upscale who really counted on government to do a lot uh, and who simply wanted somehow government to restore old values that they felt were lost the Republican coalition could agree on cutting taxes. They couldn't agree on cutting the size of government without alienating huge chunks of their own constituency, and thus the deficit happened, uh, and we're going to be stuck with that for a long time. I'll close with a thought uh, from Charlie McDowell, uh, who is a journalist for the Richmond Papers, who once said uh, that we, and this I think does speak to the sense in which we're all responsible, uh, that we elect Democrats to Congress to get what we want and Republicans to the White House so we don't have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. If you would go to the microphones that are on either side of the uh, forum, I'll recognize you. Let's try to keep the responses and the questions as brief as possible so we can get as many in as possible. Yes, sir. And burn kind of anti-tax campaign that was started with Howard Jarvis and Paul Gann in California and moved so successfully to Massachusetts with Barbara Anderson and her friends. And it focuses so much on the peccadillos and the errors of government uh, to pull to cause such public anger that you end up cutting the programs that help people that government does, and then everybody's mad at the government. So I'd like to sort of hear a response uh, from as many people as want. Yes, well, I'll start with that since I'm the, the, sort of the object of it. Um, it. It refers in a way to what E.J. was saying and what Barney said, too, about how poor politicians are more honest now. And yes, they are. I mean, politics isn't as corrupt as it used to be. And that's because primarily the press lets us know what's going on, and activist groups like mine, and there are a lot of activist groups, both left and right, that make sure the public understands that message. So I would say it's just the opposite. Um, also, I would respond already to Barney's book, which isn't even in print, Why Democrats Haven't Done Better in Presidential Elections. They don't want to. I mean, you do understand this, Congressman. The Democrats love it the way it is. The ideal situation is for the Democrats to be able to blame the Republican president and the Republican president to be able to blame the Democratic Congress. I mean, tell me it isn't nice on Beacon Hill. Everyone talks about, gee, isn't it awful that, that the Republicans are in charge. Charlie Flaherty and Bill Bulger love the fact that Bill Weld is there. They can blame him for this disruption you're talking about, for the things the programs cut. They can blame Bill Weld, who doesn't mind. He just accepts all of this and can handle it very well. And of course, the Republicans can blame the Democrats for things that aren't getting done. So the two-party system is, is simply existing so that they can blame each other, and it works out really well. But you certainly can't blame the activist groups that call this to people's attention and point out the errors and the problems and the fact that we, the people who pay for it, aren't going to put up with this anymore for the fact that, that it's happening. We don't, you can't blame the messenger or the media, and you can't blame the taxpayers and activists who pay for it all and resent paying for it all. Barney? I disagreed with some things Barbara said in the past. I must tell you, Barbara, that's the first thing that you've said, the part about Democrats not wanting to win, that I think is really dumb. Uh, it's an example, I, I must tell you, of what seems to me the, the, the mistaken view. I mean, sometimes I think the greatest form of naivete is an excessive cynicism about everything. No, that simply isn't the case at the national level. People who get involved in national politics really care about issues, and you can disagree with them, and you can think that they were, are, are, are wrong intellectually and wrong politically, and I think we've been very wrong politically, but it simply isn't the case that the Democrats are deliberately losing the presidency because we want to, quote, blame the Republicans. People that I know and work with care about who's on the Supreme Court, and they care about these domestic policies, and people have been inept in expressing that care, but it's simply flat wrong to ascribe to them some Machiavellian desire to lose. It just isn't true. Okay. All right. Let me just add one point to, to that question. Part of the problem is sometimes you need to withhold the revenue so that you can force change, you can force the system to downsize, to restructure. If the revenue keep come, keeps coming in, believe me, I was in the legislature for 14 years, whatever that revenue is, it's going to be spent. Whether it's spent effectively or ineffectively, it's going to be spent. And we operate on the premise that you've got to take the revenue you have and try to live within it, because if you simply pump more money in by raising taxes, you'll never get any change, you'll never get in, in, any reform. And I think we've had some success this year 
uh, because everyone recognized that there would be no new revenue, that you're going to have to live uh, with what the present system was producing. And in order to do that, you were going to have to change the way that the government conducted its business. And if you don't do that at times, uh, the thing will continue to grow out of control, which is what happened here in this state. I, if I could just say, I think Democrats, to paraphrase a famous governor of Massachusetts, didn't lose because of incompetence. Uh, didn't lose because of intention. It was because of incompetence. And I think that one of the reasons the middle class, broad middle class, has lost faith in government is because they do not see the government working on issues like education, housing, health care, doing the basic things the government once was perceived as doing through the GI Bill. And I think that has fed movements like the ones that Barbara Anderson had because people don't sense government is operating well on their behalf anymore. Yes, sir. Um, this, has, this question has to do with um, power senior legislators, both federal and local, have over lesser legislators, a power that turns legislators into ins or outs, just about cutting off legislators' bold ideas from getting those bold ideas out there and for consideration. What I would like to know is why can't our legislators create a law with majority whip seats, House majority whip seats, Speaker of the House seats, or either put a term limitation on them or rotate them, or somehow create, this, create a situation where we don't end up with people like Bolgers and, and Jim Wrights? Well, part of the problem is that uh, you know, under the Constitution, the legislature, the branch, the House or the Senate, make their own rules uh, so that once you get in, you become very quickly a part of the system. I mean, in our system here in Massachusetts, both the Speaker and the President have tremendous power over the legislative agenda and over the individual <clears throat> members, the power uh, to appoint chairman who will get extra pay. Uh, means that those chairmen are going to have to be fairly loyal uh, to the presiding officer. So there have been efforts in the past, uh, rules reform, so-called, to say that, you know, maybe we ought to do like the Congress does and pay every legislator the same so that, you know, if you, if you cross the speaker or the president and he decides uh, you, he's going to remove you from your committee, uh, you may get removed as the committee chair, but it's not going to take money out of your pocket. Uh, so I think that there's a lot that can be done uh, to disperse the power in our state legislature. I Especially. think the Congress has done it to some extent, uh, but here in Massachusetts, it's, uh, it's only happened a little bit. I, it, I agree with uh, Paul Salucci. At first, I wasn't sure when you talked about the power that senior legislators have over junior legislators. Um, I thought you were talking about a federalism thing, and at this point, I must tell you, as a member of the Massachusetts Congressional Delegation, it is the Massachusetts legislators who will draw the lines, who have all the power, and if any of them are listening, if there's anything he or she wants, please call me. Um, but well, the, don't uh, forget about the governor's veto. No. Uh, but the... Um, That's why he agreed with you. <laughs> the difference that Paul Salucci talked about is the relevant one. That is much more of a problem at state legislative levels than at the federal level. You mentioned Jim Wright. Jim Wright was speaker for two and a half years, so if you limited his term, I don't know how much you would have limited it to. And he was I'll forced out as speaker, years. I think a little excessively harshly, I must say, in retrospect, by the House itself. Jim Wright lost his position because the majority of members of the House over which he presided as speaker were prepared to vote uh, to uh, reprimand him, and that made it uh, intolerable. At the federal level, I think we have done a better job of dispersing the power for the reasons that Paul talked about. Seniority governs a lot. At the state level, it, it is not as bad as it used to be in the House. When I served in the House in the 70s, uh, I spent most of my time on the outs, and, I, and yes, it was a much too rigid a system, and there is still too much power for the leadership at the state legislative levels institutionally. I don't think that's a problem at the federal level. Yeah, I'll yes, respond, sir, I'll, I want to respond, uh, too, okay. um, because Let's I think that, that, that's quickly. an excellent yeah. question. And it's something that I used to wonder about when I was, when I was, as Barney would recommend, naive instead of cynical, and I'm not giving up one inch of my